<laughs> Welcome to the panel. This is uh, Dynamite the Next 10 Years. Um, my name is Keith Davidson. I work uh, on the sales and marketing end of Dynamite Entertainment. And I am joined by two special guests. To my direct left, I have Ron Mars, who has worked with us on two projects, I believe. Maybe perhaps more that I'm unaware of. But uh, you worked on Prophecy several years ago, but most recently you worked on, uh, you have been working on John Carter, Warlord of Mars. Ron Mars, ladies and gentlemen. Mars of Mars. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and on, on Ron's other side is uh, Francesco Francavia, the Eisner Award winning uh, artist of just about everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll read it. It's true. But uh, uh, for, for, uh, for Dynamite, he's done, he's provided covers to uh, such projects as Reanimator. He's doing the upcoming James Bond book. Uh, he did Django Zaro, um, Justice Incorporated, The Avenger, uh, and many, no, Rangers, many more. Et cetera. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. It would, it would be easier to list the stuff that he hasn't done a couple right, before. Right, right. Yeah, why? Have you done uh, adolescent radioactive hamsters? Uh, I forgot the word black belt. Uh, that's somewhere. I've done the World of the Mars. But before, before my... Be, be, before Mars of Mars. I, I, I one, of my, one of my insistences for taking over the book was make sure he didn't do any more covers. <laughs> was in the book Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, I, I think uh, I think uh, we'll just jibber jabber about the projects that we've been working on. I can mention a few upcoming Dynamite projects, and then I think I'd like to open it to the floor for any questions. I can tell you things that are coming up with Dynamite that may be relevant to uh, what your own particular interests are. Um, but if I could start with with Ron, maybe I can have him talk about uh, his passion for John Carter, Warlord of Mars, which goes back long, long, long before we approached uh, we approached him to uh, to work on the series. Yes. Yes. Um, I like it. So, um, so did anybody see the John Carter movie? That guy. He's my favorite guy. This guy too. The, the you won? Like for, the, for the rest of you, you're the reason it failed. That's, a that's, one. that's not true. That's <coughs> Disney's the reason it failed. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so, like, I... I discovered the John Carter books at that magic age of 11 or 12, which, you know, basically, I always feel like the stuff that you, uh, that you plug into at that age is the stuff that sticks with you the rest of your life, right? It's like for the generation uh, beyond mine, uh, it's Ninja Turtles and Transformers, right? It's just a bunch of 35-year-old dudes running around with Ninja Turtles. And I look at that stuff and I go, Jesus, why don't you guys grow up? <laughs> But, you know, if somebody says John Carter or Tarzan, I'm like, oh, oh that's the coolest stuff ever. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, basically, my nostalgia is cool, yours sucks. Um, and everybody feels that way. So, um, I've literally wanted to write John Carter since I discovered those books at 11 or 12 years old. And just never, you know, just didn't seem to be the sort of thing that would ever happen. I knew Marvel did comics in the 70s that I, you know, that I sought out as a real small kid. Um, and we have some lovely covers on Keith's laptop here yeah. that you guys can't Again, see. After the, the after best the, you can huddle over my shoulder, it will be great. I have, I, some, I have some really nice Bart Sears covers who's sitting right behind me and down on the show floor. Um, so when it was announced that, uh, that Dynamite was going to do uh, John Carter and uh, Tarzan, but under the guise of Warlord of Mars and uh, Lord, of the Lord of the Jungle, so that there weren't that there weren't were they were unauthorized editions. Um, I I sought out uh, Nick Berucci, who uh, who runs Dynamite, in in a bar in San Diego during the convention, and basically accosted him and said, "Why didn't you offer me those books?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and he said, oh, uh, sorry, sorry, I, we didn't, I didn't know you wanted them. Um, so, but he said, at that time, 
So uh, Rod, Rod is uh, like three feet taller than me. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but then it's again, scary. but then again, everybody's three feet taller than me. Actually, so. that's a great way to get a job at, at Dynamite is if you go to Nick Barucci and then threaten him and, yes. and then say MF or to him. Threaten the publisher. In, um, in, in person, he'll back off and then he'll hire you. Well, that's how you got there. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so so anyway, at that time, Nick said, "Look, if we ever if we relaunch or whatever we you know." However, we proceed with this. Um, I'll give you a call, and you know, and true to his word, when they decided they were going to relaunch the book uh, as an authorized edition, uh, because they made nice with Edgar Rice Burroughs Inc., who I also do some work for, yeah. um, they uh, Nick called me and it took me you know three seconds to say yes. Um, so uh, you know, I literally this is fulfilling a childhood dream for me. Um, That's when I said, you know, as long as Francesca is not involved. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I had that written under the contract. No, uh, no Italian cover artist whatsoever. Oh, oh. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> uh, so it's you know it's been a joy ever since. Uh, the first uh, the first arc was drawn by an Indian artist named Abhishek Malsuni, uh, who was who was a guy that I worked with on a different project for an Indian publisher uh, as his editor, and it was always in the back of my mind that if I ever got to write John Carter, he was the guy I wanted to work with because uh, his stuff was just suited to it. Um, and then uh, Abhishek moved off the book after the first arc, and, the, and a Mexican artist named Ariel Medell is uh, is on the book now. He's also doing terrific stuff. Uh, the colorist is an Indian guy named uh, Nanjan Jamberi, who is doing phenomenal stuff and uh, has colored every issue. So there's a there's a nice uh, continuity to him. Um, Issue 11 just came out this week. Uh, the trade paperback of the first arc comes out in November. Does that sound right? I can check. Am my I making that up? I think the first one comes out in November. It, yeah, it's it's really close to being out. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, we I try to write it from the point of view of trying to make sure that everybody who had never read John Carter as a kid had never read the novels, maybe hadn't even seen the movie, that these books would be welcoming to you and, and would be a ground floor read. So the first issue um, I'm really proud of because I think we we came up with a method to introduce the, the characters and the subject matter kind of in story and then let the let the story race from there. And what were the, what were the elements of John Carr that you felt that you were most excited to include in your series? What were the things that you like that has to be part of it? Naked Princess. Naked Princess. We, we don't actually have her naked. She's covered up a little bit. Yeah. But she's she's pretty. She's, she's naked in my mind. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, again, you discover these books at 12 years old that, that you know, half naked Martian princess is a really good draw. Um, uh, but I wanted to make sure that, that Deja Thoris, you know, could kick your ass. Uh, so. She's she's very much uh, every bit the hero that John Carter is, um, and uh, it's just it's a world that I you know that I dearly love and and that I think really is the inspiration for a lot of uh, a lot of what came after it. You know, the Star Wars and Avatar trace their roots back to John Carter in very obvious ways. Superman traces its roots back to John Carter in a very obvious way. Um, so to me, it's the, it's sort of the the. the the seed from which a lot of other stuff grew, and um, you know, I'll do the book until they you know, pry it out of my cold dead hands. <laughs> That's another threat. MF her. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, let's, uh, let's 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 tackle something with uh, with Francesco for a second. Um, with exclusive. Uh, with exclusive artwork that uh, uh, John. that I can. <laughs> I can oh, see here. It's beautiful. Uh, Let me just I'll describe it to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Francesco, you've worked on so many covers for Dynamite. Um, you have a long-standing uh, friendship, fr friendship with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with uh, with Nick Barucci. Um, is there a particular project that spoke to you maybe more so than the others? I mean, there's there's so much you've done. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I was signing several books today. People. Uh, keep bringing me books that um, uh, are over uh, at Dynamite. And I think some of my favorite runs were the Long Rangers covers that I done and the uh, Dark Shadows. Yes. So those, uh, those in particular, I mean, like you said, I've done 
everything in the shed of the spider and I enjoy every single one. But those covers for especially for, for the Lone Ranger and maybe my, some of my, my personal uh, favorite because um, growing up, you know, I was watching all those uh, Western movies and uh, Hidal is known for you know, Spaghetti Western, Sergio Leone, uh, one of the oldest comic book, I think the oldest comic book in Italy is the Tex Wheeler, which is uh, you know, a Western book. So yeah, just drawing cowboy style, you know, horses, it's, it's been really fun. And, and now with, with Dark Shadows, that's... That were you, were you a follow uh, were you a follower of the show back then? No, uh, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't aware of the show uh, when uh, when Dynamite asked me to do the the covers for Dark Shadows. I, I think it was right before the movie was coming out, the one with Johnny Depp, which uh, you know I found out that that uh, is very little of what the TV show was about. Uh, so I went on YouTube and started to. Discover this thing, but yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed the the seventies, the, the the gothic uh, look of it. So, and I tried to uh, transfer that, you know, graphically with, with with my spin on it, of course. But uh, so yeah, that was like uh, I'm discovering so many things now working here in the states that is uh, like a popular culture, but uh, not everything goes outside the the borders. Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, chips made to Italy. Mm. <laughs> Frank Poncherello. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> 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 what a good show! We <laughs> said, how cool is like, all this uh, freaky accident on the uh, California highways? Um, you know, uh, Miami Vice. I mean, there is several shows that make made, you know, to foreign countries. Uh, but Dark Shadows was not one of them. Uh, Archie, you know, I'm drawing Archie, but those comics, uh, we never saw them in Italy. So, so by now I'm learning, while I'm drawing, I'm learning all these uh, new, uh, uh, new universes, you know, that uh, are related to these characters have been around for uh, forever. So it's a, it's a learning experience while I'm, I'm having fun drawing, you know, the comics. I actually, um, it's interesting because uh, even though I, I do just I do largely sales and marketing for, for Dynamite myself, I, I actually have uh, ties with the two of you in a creative way. And Ron probably doesn't even know this yet. I wrote I wrote a comic book series for Dynamite called Reanimator because I did a four issue series, and the both of you have worked on Reanimator at, at, at Dynamite. So, Ron, you included Reanimator in your massive crossover, The uh, Prophecy. And uh, Francesco, you did, did, cover. you did cover so, uh, for, for uh, the Rain of for month in, month out. Which was, uh, I think it was some of my recent favorites. Uh, oh, the good. covers are done and done. But you just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, and was, I mean, they're, they're, they were fun. I mean, I, I know when the cover is really strong. I mean, I can tell. I've been doing this for a while. So, <laughs> that's what I do. Covers. Yes. Now, so Francesca, you actually you dabble with a lot of the, the dynamite characters individually on the different different books, and then and then Ron, you actually have tackled so many different characters in one book. Well, yeah, the prophecy uh, again. That was a thing where I don't know Nick just called up out of the blue and said, "Hey, we're gonna do you know we're gonna do this big crossover. You know, you, you do these things all the time. We want you to write it." And then the the, the cast of character. I mean, we knew it was gonna be Red Sonia. Because that was she was going to be the main character, but then the, the the cast around her kept changing, and you know first we're going to have some of the pulp characters, and then we weren't, and then and then uh, it was just going to be all the females, and then we wanted to get more of a mix, and so uh, I mean I think before I actually sat down to write the first issue, we had six or seven different rosters of who was going to be included because obviously all of this the, the majority of this stuff, this stuff is licensed material, and you have to. So there's a kind of a two-layer approval process for whoever owns the character, and then and then Dynamite itself, and and sometimes those are moving targets. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, that's why uh, Reanimator and um, Ash like show up halfway through Prophecy because we weren't sure that they were going to be in it. We weren't sure that we could get permission, and we had to get started on the first issue. So I, 
you know, we sort of built in, oh yeah, like issue four, there's going to be a reason for them to show up, and you know, then it was my job to come up with a reason for them to show up. Right. Um, but you know, the, to me, the crossovers are some of the most fun you can have because most of the time it involves putting together characters that have not met each other before, so you have sort of that built-in uh, that built-in drama of, of you know, do we fight? Do we you know? Do we kiss? Do we? What do we? Do? You know. Right. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, it, it, prophecy was a weird one because it was just like, and we we also had to. You know, it was for the for the 2012 Doomsday Prophecy, so we had to, you know, we had to make sure it came out in 2012. Uh, yeah. We couldn't be late with it. Uh, although, you know, if, like if the world did end and the last issue didn't come out on time, it wouldn't really matter. Right. It probably that may have made it the most timely dynamite book that there ever has been. Yeah, there was no, there was no screwing around. It was. Uh, although, thankfully, we had uh, Walter Giovanni, who was a terrific mm -hmm. artist from Brazil, uh, drawing the book. Um, who Walter uh, has drawn uh, Gail Simone's Red Sonia run, um, and he is terrific, uh, and he is also really fast. He's a he's a page a day animal, uh, so we knew that you know getting him on the book was going to be you know we weren't going to have problems. If if there were deadline problems, it was going to be my fault, not his. Right. Now uh, the prophecy prophecy series. I don't know. Was, was do you think that was Dynamite's first crossover book? I think it was. I think it was like the first sort of real. Crossover with a bunch of different right. characters. Now, obviously, uh, now we, we we're like sixty percent. Now you guys are like crossover whores. <laughs> that, <laughs> totally. that, that, that was before masks. Yeah, yes. yeah. It was before, oh, masks. before masks. Well, I think I think that because yeah. we were initially talking about prophecy as including, and I you know I was like begging to include the shadow. Uh, I was begging to include Green Hornet, and it, it eventually prophecy. Wow, that was kind of creepy. <laughs> uh, if, if if one goes off over there, everybody go right out that door. Right. Um, you guns blazing. Oh my God! The shadow. <laughs> um, so I, I think what you know, I don't know this for sure, but I think what eventually happened is that the decision was made. Okay, well we'll put these characters in prophecy, and then we'll put all the pulp characters in masks. Right. Which which Francesco did many covers for. Yeah. yeah. And also for the sequel mask too. Right. Did you do? Uh, yes, I, th I done the. Yeah, it was the. I think for the uh, Avengers. Oh, Justice Incorporated. The Justice Avengers. Incorporated. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you did the covers for that as well. The the first round of Justice Incorporated uh, had uh, the Shadow, uh, the Avenger, and Doc and, Savage. Uh, right. Right. So I was uh, alternating uh, characters on the cover. And then eventually, when you said, uh, Ron, you had said that the. Originally, prophecy might have been all the female characters. Eventually, we did that as our own thing too. We did some, a series called Swords of Sorrow, which was our big yeah. summer event this year, um, which was just the all the all female group. So it's kind of like you were the it's a testing ground for I massive crossover. I was the guinea pig, right? I was the I was, <laughs> I, was, right. I was the first guy they sent across the threshold. If I didn't get shot, then, you know, then everybody else could go. <laughs> and, you, and you didn't get shot, and now the, that's the dynamite way. Well, you know, here's the, the, the you know, the, the bitter truth of the whole thing is, uh, everybody bitches and moans about, oh, there's so many crossovers. You guys buy them. So, you know, that's ultimately the message that you send all publishers, whether it's Marvel or DC or whatever. When they do crossovers, you guys buy them, you send the message that you want more crossovers. So. You know, you bought Prophecy, you got more crossovers. What's, what's interesting is that it's, it really is about iconic characters you know so well interacting with somebody that may be completely different from them. Like, I mean, uh, Francesco did the covers for Django Zara. And, like, yeah. those are, I mean, those are concepts which seem to make a lot of sense together, but characterizations which, just the interaction themselves, you would imagine it's going to be such a conflict of character or just a very interesting combination of people. Yeah, I mean, the, if, I think that if you have a good story, it doesn't matter. You, know, you can put things so that uh, may look weird together. But, you know, if you have a good story, it may work. I, mean, I think, it's, I think it's better when they're like, you know, There's more sort of weird. Yeah. And, you know, I've done I mean, Batman aliens and Batman Tarzan. I just, you know, felt like the Green Lantern aliens. I just felt like stuff that uh, hadn't run into each other is always good fodder for a story. Sure. Um, and you know, you guys having as many licenses as you do, as many sort of 
different things in the stable just kind of lends itself to that. Sure. Yeah, just this year we're doing uh, crossovers that we've done this year. We, well, Red Sonja Conan, which is completely makes sense. Um, but then we did Aliens Vampirella. Uh, we did Vampirella Army of Darkness. We just finished Django Zaro. Um, and we have more lined up. I, I, I can't remember any of them. You're doing a Kenken without the, the next one? James uh, well, Bond versus Bob's Burger. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually they did that in episode That's four. That's what I shot now when I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but now that you did bring it up, one of our biggest projects that's coming up, if we're, if we're going to be talking about James uh, Dynamite coming down the line, uh, we are releasing the first ever issue of, well, not the first ever, but the first comic book uh, dedicated to James Bond uh, <laughs> in over 20 years. Uh, James Bond number one will be in stores on November 4th. That's two days before the Daniel Craig uh, Spectre movie. Um, it is written by Warren Ellis. Art is by Jason Masters. Um, it's uh, set in modern era. It doesn't look like Daniel Craig because uh, our, our comic is kind of independent of the film franchise, but um, it's something that we're really, really excited about. It's going to be a big, a big deal. And we, have, of course, do publish, as, as, as Francesca pointed out, we publish Bob's Burgers, based on the very, very popular TV series. Um, and that has been like a runaway success. That may be our best-selling book right now. And it keeps on, the numbers are, I think they've actually increased, which is impressive, yeah. Um, so having a TV show that your book is based on is a good idea? Yeah, um, <laughs> turns out. a TV show that is actually running uh, Before con the book. concurrently with the book as opposed to a 1978 uh, <laughs> Battlestar Galactica comes to, comes to mind, the classic Battlestar, which we've done very well. But, um, um, well, I, you know, yeah. I, just to, to interrupt, Go ahead. Um, I just, you know, as... You know, you get into this business because you love comics, and after a while, frankly, you get sort of jaded. Um, you get free books, you get on comp list, and after a while, you, you know, it's like the, you know, man, donuts are awesome, unless you work in a donut shop, and then you don't want to see another donut as long as you live. Um, so the stuff that gets us excited about comics, I think, is is... You know, it's not rare, but it's not, you know, but there's a lot of stuff we don't pay a whole lot of attention to. Uh, to me, the James Bond news is, you know, I just about fell out of my seat when, when I saw it announced. Um, mostly because I had always been told, and had made some inquiries myself, just out of curiosity, that yeah, there, there will never be a James Bond comic because the rights are a mess. And, the, you know, there's there's the, the Fleming Estate, and there's the, the film companies, and there's the broccolis, and it's just... Just this this tangle of rights that will never get untangled, and that's why there will never be a James Bond book. Yeah, there's James Bond. Until book. Nick comes around. Uh, right. <laughs> so yeah, Nick cut the Gordian knot, and I just think it's I you know as a as a reader, as a guy who obviously you know loves comics because I do it every day, I'll be the first one in line for that comic when it comes out because I just feel like that's a comic that should be there every month, you know, for the rest of our lives. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's such a natural uh, translation to comics. Uh, and obviously you got a really good team on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm a huge Bond fan anyway, so uh, I just think it's, I think it's awesome and I hope that, you know, I hope that it sells Things gangbusters wrong, yeah. because, uh, you know, we should always have James Bond comics. Sure. And that's, that's one of the funny things is that you, you have these icons of pop culture, like Darth Vader and Mickey Mouse and uh, Captain America, and, and those characters have comics, and then you have James Bond is every bit a global brand as as those characters, and has not been in comics. And you're right, it was all because of of, of licensing issues and rights issues. Yeah, I mean, the, generally, the, the only comics that you, you would see, and I would, if I saw them in a back issue bin at a show, I would pick them up, it's, it's like the Marvel adaptations of the, mm -hmm. you know, kind of lousy Roger Moore movies. <laughs> uh, Breaker. Wasn't that um, like a British edition of... I mean, the original... Yeah, but all, the all the older, yeah, yeah, the yeah, older yeah. stuff. Um, it but, was like, it was on streets or something. Yeah, it was like a newspaper strip yeah, that yeah. was then reprinted, but it's, you know, it's, uh, I just think it's the, it's as cool as it comes, and um, 
covers look great, the interiors look great. Um, I'm really excited for it. They look and, great. And, and right I'm not here. being paid to say this, so <laughs> maybe Nick will buy me a drink at the bar later, but you know, that's that's the extent of my compensation. Um other other projects that are, are coming up just so I can I can mention some of the the things we've got planned for the next few months at the very least. Um, we will, uh, we, we mentioned uh, the characters Red Sonia before and, and Swords of Sorrow. Our big Swords of Sorrow uh, summer events, which was spearheaded in, in, in many ways by Gail Simone, um, that is going to kind of pan out in a new interesting way starting in January. We're going to relaunch uh, Red Sonia and Deja Thoris and uh, Vampirella based on some ideas that Gail has given us for where she wants those characters actually to go. And so she's she's kind of being the godfather type figure behind the scenes telling us what she wants and then we are having new creators come in to do some interesting slants on those characters starting in January and, and proceeding on. Um, uh, we, we aren't allowed to announce who's working on the projects yet, but uh, they're actually really, really strong names. Um, in January, we're also going to be launching a series called Devolution by Rick Rem uh, Remender. Uh, Devolution is a series about, uh, it's a post-apocalyptic scenario in which uh, the majority of humanity has started to devolve into uh, caveman-esque or worse kinds of creatures. Uh, so it's a survival tale against that kind of backdrop. Um, we have a new series called Seduction of the Innocent. If anybody's familiar with that, that phrase, Seduction of the Innocent, it, it has a special relevance in, in the comics community because in the 50s, um, a, a, a psychologist named Dr. Frederick Wortham railed against comic companies like EC Comics for publishing uh, crime and horror comics that were a little too, uh, too violent, too uh, grotesque for that era, or their sensibilities anyway. We're publishing a comic book series called Seduction of the Innocent, which basically rise, tries to reclaim um, that that kind of feel of a comic. Um, and that, actually, Francesco has uh, illustrated the covers to that, the, the entire series, right? Yeah, yeah I've been doing the, the main covers. It's been fun to get back into the DC Comics. Well, yeah, but there, there, there was a clear direction when they asked me to kind of evoke the DC style, which, you know, it's not the big stretch for me because. Uh, I love that kind of comic, so I always try to channel a little bit, especially when it's a, a horror book, you know, definitely you see the brights and coming out, or the, the those uh, those old guys, you know, from Creepy and AC comics. Do you feel like you need to actually delve into visual reference for a lot of these things as far as to get a feel, or do you, are you capable well, of getting a feel to be yourself? Uh, I get the feel inside. <laughs> I got a feel down already because I mean I've been again. Uh, the, I was reading those comics before even reading uh, superhero. So, uh, but uh, if there is uh, some specific cover that uh, they want me to uh, know to, so yeah, I mean I'm gonna look for it. But uh, some are so iconic that you know that, that there is no need to to look it up because I already know which cover uh, that they're talking about. So, like the first one, which has been released already, is, um, you know, was a note to the classic cover of, uh, of the guy holding the woman's head yeah. with the knives, and there's a body. But, you know, we, we uh, in my cover, there, there is a, a man's head, and, you know, there is an axe, and, and instead to have the body in the background, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of move things around. So the killer is in the background, and there is this end that you can tell is the you know the hand of a decapitated man in the foreground. So I can switch a bit of the perspective. So it is a thought, but it's not like a, a right out tribute to that cover. So good. And I'm trying to remember. I think I already done the second name. Yeah. It's kind of hard to keep it going. <laughs> uh, well, it, uh, I'd like to open it up to anybody else. If anybody has want, uh, has a question for Ron or Francesco or just about dynamite in general, um, yes, please, sir. Question for both of you. Um, you had me. You hooked Ken Bald. Uh, that he did the the comic book strip. Uh, I mean, for the newspapers. 
the old Dark Shadow strip for the newspapers. Uh, in doing Dark Shadows, did, in your research in addition to the old TV show, how was the, uh, did you go through any of the, the newspaper strips? And on the Green Shadow, I'm also a big fan of old time radio. Uh, as far as the old 40s Green Shadow radio programs, um, do you go through those to kind of get a feel of, of the language of the time and and uh, uh, the settings and, you know? Do you want to refer to talk yeah, about the Yeah, uh, I mean, um, uh, for Dark Shadows, no, I haven't seen those, those strips, but I did see uh, in my searches the I think there was like paperbacks, uh, probably like prose novel uh, connected. So that most some had like photograph covers, but I always know that it was like in an oval, like you know, framed in an oval or something. And uh, and there were also some uh, pendant covers. So that was uh, my only, you know, this classic from the 60s and 70s paperback covers that uh, were a bit of an inspiration, you know, partial inspiration for for the. Dark Shadows covers. Um, I remember uh, particularly um, when uh, Jonathan Fried died, I was working on one of the cover, and... Uh, um, it's kind of your fault, is what you're saying? <laughs> Do we want to go there? <laughs> because uh, I did a drawing uh, to tribute to my abuse, and the next week he died. So, I don't know. You don't want to be drawn yeah. by me. That's 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 by the way. But uh, um, no, um, I didn't know. I'm assuming he was already old and was sick or whatever. But uh, yeah, the news was that he passed away, and I was working. Um, it was like on issue 10, 11 already. So I've been drawing covers for a year already for Dark Shadows. Um, but because of that, I actually changed the, the idea for the cover and did uh, this big uh, uh, tonsil and with uh, with uh, Barnabas speaking from behind and you know I have a dedication to, to Jonathan Fried. So um, and regarding the, the radio show, I'm a huge fan of the plastic pulp radio. Uh, I used that um, when I work on, on Black Beetle uh, and I used that when I did that short story for the Shadow 100 anniversary. Uh, so yeah, I tried to use the, the way they were talking back then, you know, on the, the radio show. I get influenced a lot by that. I can, I, I'm certain, I'm certain that uh, <coughs> Michael Uslin, who wrote the uh, Shadow Green Hornet crossover, um, he is a guy who is incredibly well researched and, and very knowledgeable about, uh, about Hulk radio shows and that kind of thing. And you, can, oh, you, can, you can see it in the work that he does, that he has done for Dynamite. And so I'm certain that he was he was listening to those shows and was influenced by them in, in, when he wrote at least the Shadow Green Horn and Crossover. So, yes, hi. Um, the Seduction of the Innocent, I might have just zoned out on that, but um, you, you were saying that's coming out next year? or That's going to be out in December. Yes, Shut up. Seduction of the Innocent, it's written by... Uh, Andy, Parks. Andy Parks, and with uh, interior art by uh, Esteva Poles. I never had, knew how to pronounce his name. Esteva Poles, yeah, he's a, a, yeah, he's a uh, Spanish. Yeah. Uh, but that's the same team that has done the Lone Ranger, so I was uh, happy to be together with those guys. It's, it's like a, it's a family reunion. Getting the band back together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but without horses. Uh, more access, less horses. I got horses. <laughs> in the selection of innocent? Oh, I got horses on my about my property. No, no, no. The, you, you need reference for horses. You just come see me. I'll hook you up. I, I can draw a horse right now. Without <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> right. Someone's really... You don't trust me? Oh my god. That's, that's the horse. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> yes. Future plans for like Battlestar, Okay. And statues. And statues. Okay, so uh, let's hit them in order. Uh, Battlestar Galactica. Uh, honestly, I believe we are on a not really like an intentional hiatus, but it just it just so happened that way. Um, we kind of overlapped both our uh, Battlestar Galactica six storyline 
which was a um, which was uh, set in the the revised or the the the, the reimagined Battlestar universe. That came out and uh, Battle of Star Galactica: The Death of Apollo, which is based in the classic era, and also our steampunk Battle Star Galactica, which was uh, a complete reimagining of our own. All of these things happened pretty much back to back to back, and and now we find ourselves in the middle of a of a, of a little gap where we're not putting out any Battle Star titles right now. Um, there is. It, there so is a Battlestar Galactica series, series well, that we are working on, but I can't mention anything because it's, it's very high concept. So, uh, to give you any kind of inkling would, would, would be bad for me. <laughs> I would have consequences internally with my company. Um, uh, it would probably be, be, I would imagine, something that you would see probably uh, mid-2016. Um, with regard to, uh, you brought up the King titles, uh, that's, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, King is what we kind of just called our King Features titles, which includes Flash Gordon, uh, Mandrake the Magician, Jungle Jim, Prince Valiant, and uh, the Phantom Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> there, I know there's five, but listing them at all once. Um, that, we had a very loosely tied together cross guard. It wasn't really a crossover, but it, it, it established all five of those characters as being part of the same universe uh, in, in five titles that we released uh, earlier this year. Um, that is going to yield into uh, a, a new series. I think we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what to call it because uh, I think Flash is going to be the, the central character of it. Do we want to call it Flash and then have the other characters be supporting cast members, or do we want to call it straight up King or something? Um, uh, but that is, that's that's coming, I would imagine, somewhere along the lines, either uh, March or April of 2016. Uh, the Gold Key titles, that is, uh, we are going to bring back the Gold Key titles uh, in a large capacity as some kind of major crossover of those characters. Uh, the Gold Key titles, for those of you that don't know, um, for us, that included a number of the characters that a, lot, a number of the characters that people pop, uh, probably remember best uh, in the 1990s as, as part of the Valiant universe. Um, but we we've kind of brought them uh, into our own banner. Um, the characters include uh, Torok Dinosaur Hunter, uh, Magnus Robot Fighter, uh, Doctor uh, Doc, Doc Spectre, Spectre um, and. Uh, Solar Man the Atom, which is funny, I always call it Solar. I think most people pronounce it Solar, but why doesn't anyone say Solar? Uh, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, but those characters are coming back, and, and when they do, it'll be together. They will be together in an event. Um, and finally, statues. We released our first statue uh, recently, uh, Vampirella, um, uh, and we have along the pipelines, we uh, we have a statue dedicated to Purgatory, one of the Chaos Comics characters, uh, which should be out, I believe, next month. Um, it's certainly manufactured, it's just, it's on a boat on the way over from China. Um, and the third statue in our line is Jungle Girl, uh, based on uh, the character created by uh, Frank Cho. Um, beyond that, um, Nothing from Mars just yet. Uh, I think the idea would be to have Deja Thoris as a statue sometime, again, probably middle of 2016, I would imagine. Um, it's inevitable. Yes, Deja, Deja is definitely going to. I think we're focusing largely on the ladies. Um, our line right now is, is just straight up called the Women of Dynamite. Um, doesn't mean we're not going to have a Wula statue at some point, uh, which Rod would probably be really excited about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want a plush Willow. That's, you know, that's yeah. like the one thing I wanted yeah. out of the movie. And we, we, we should definitely do that. I think, actually, we probably have the, the ability to, like, that's probably that's, a cutout in our That's in like our printing money, baby. Yeah. That's just... Close. <laughs> hey! That's a first challenge. Thank you. Happy now? <laughs> this one doesn't have a saddle, though. So. <laughs> Horses have no, no, four no. legs. <laughs> oh. 
You chill now. <laughs> well, um, any more friends? <laughs> uh, any other? Questions? Yes, sir. I actually have a three-part question. One for Ron. Have you decided to go start work on more of the, the John Mars for like a separate series for it, like like more on to different characters so it brings out the the characters in a sense? I, I would love to. I mean, it's all about it's all about how many books you guys buy. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, ultimately any publisher is concerned with the bottom line to a great extent. Um, so, and certainly at Dynamite, it's it's even more uh, about that because you guys don't own a lot of the characters that you print. So it's not like you can say, well, well, you know, we'll do this book and hopefully we'll sell the movie rights down the road and we'll recoup our money that way. I mean, that's not that's not the business plan here. Um, so, uh, so literally every you know every sale counts. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a huge Edgar Rice Burroughs fan. Um, you know, John Carter, Tarzan, any of the stuff they they obviously you guys have a good relationship with uh, the Burroughs estate now. Um, I actually do Sunday style strips for the Edgar Rice Burroughs website. Um, I do uh, Korak with Rick Leonardi and uh, the Mucker with Lee Motor. Um, it's two two bucks a month for a subscription. And they have, I think, about 18 strips now. Uh, so it's obviously kind of a bargain for two bucks. Um, so uh, I would work on, you know, I, I grew up reading Edgar Rice Burroughs and being inspired by him to want to be a writer. So uh, any Burroughs stuff that comes across my plate is, is something I'm going to do. If anybody, the, the, I actually just looked it up, the, um, the John Carter Volume 1 of course. Uh, trade paperback that Ron wrote uh, is, is slated to be released in, in two weeks. Uh, it says October 7th on our website. Um, if you haven't read uh, the stories, I, I absolutely love the opening story to our John Carter Warler and Mars story. And Ron created like such a cool group of villains, like the, the main villain that he created, the, uh, the, the, the former Union General is it? Is it general or colonel? I, I can't remember. He was a he was a captain. Captain. Uh, because um, he was uh, one of the things that bothered me as a kid about the John Carter novel was that I mean I I loved them, but I never felt like there was a worthy opponent for him. He was always you know he's basically Superman on Mars, and everybody else wasn't. So he could he kind of kick everybody's ass. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that when we did the comic, we had a a worthy opponent finally that we you know we had. Uh, we had a Joker to his Batman, and so um, so the villain that we created for the first story arc is a uh, John Carter is a is a Confederate uh, cavalry captain. Uh, so we can so we meaning me I guess uh, created a a Union cavalry officer uh, who is the antithesis of John Carter. He is uh, he is without honor, whereas honor is you know paramount to John Carter. He's He's greedy. He's venal, uh, but he's every bit the warrior that John Carter is because on Mars they are Superman, um, and the, the backstory reveals that they had actually met in battle during the Civil War. So this is kind of a deep-seated hatred that this guy has for John Carter. So it's a very personal, uh, it's a very personal animosity between the two of them. I absolutely loved his army of, of aliens too. There was like a like the the, the Mars mythos has its own alien type, and then you had introduced these other aliens that kind of joined with the uh, the captain, the, the evil Union captain. Um, very cool, very cool well, stuff. Thanks, it was, uh, you know, I really, the, the first story arc I thought was, you know, we have to make people love these characters in this world, so we put everything we had into it. And you had other questions? is uh, regarding Highlander, we don't have the rights to Highlander anymore, unfortunately. Um, I, I think the, the rights on that one are also really convoluted. Yeah, I think. I've been, I've been, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. So I, I'm not sure. Uh, we certainly don't have it anymore, but uh, but uh, 
we, I wish we did. We did some really good Highlander stuff. Um, and as far as uh, more crossovers with, uh, you said Red Sonia, uh, Conan, use Beastmaster. Yeah, we. Um, I don't know if we've looked into that before, but that's an interesting one. Beastmaster's perfectly suited to comics, I would imagine. Look, anytime you can get Tanya Roberts into a comic, I, I find yeah. that to be a, I find that to be a fine, uh, a fine venture. Yes, yes. She made a, gr a much greater character in Beastmaster than uh, Bridget Nielsen in, as uh, as Red Sonia. You know, when you can outact Bridget Nielsen. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Uh, there, I believe that there are some, some uh, there, there is a project we have announced um, coming up. It is, uh, we, we now have the rights to do uh, Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, um, and who was created originally, I believe, by Will Eisner, yeah. and uh, co-created by Will Eisner, I can't remember who the other person is, uh, can't, but, um, but um, Will Eisner actually created that character as kind of a female equivalent of, of, of Tarzan. So we will be having a Sheena uh, slash uh, Lord of the Jungle crossover. Um, we don't use the name Tarzan in our, in our titling, um, but... Do you have the rights to do that now? Uh, we, I mean, we have a good relationship with Edgar Rice Burroughs, but there's an agreement that they had established uh, with Dark Horse. That's where we see more uh, Right, so, so Dark Horse has Tarzan the name, and we can we can use Tarzan in our in our books as well. And uh, just we, not in the title. Just in the title. Yeah, just not in the title. So. But uh, but you'll be you'll be seeing more more Tarzan from us in the Lord of Jungle crossover with the Sheena. And also we're we're talking about other other new projects with that character too. So And you mentioned about the online world stuff, three changing points, all that stuff. Um, still like stuff in print, yeah. That's uh, that's the hope. I mean, the intention is for, for the Burroughs guys is that they, they want to move the stuff into print eventually. Um, I have suggested to the parties involved that there be a conversation because it seems like it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's a pretty wide range of stuff. Um, I, I think eventually that stuff will see print. Um, I just don't know what venue it'll be. Um, they're all done as as Sunday style strips, so it's it's more of a, a landscape format than a traditional comics format. But you know, it seems to me to make sense to do them, you know, across, you know, across the spread. Uh, you know, one one Sunday strip takes up two pages. And how much? Uh, how, how many have you done? Or like, how much content uh, is there? Not as many as they want me to. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there is a lot between all of the strips. Yeah. There's, I believe, the specific term is a shitload of content. Um, <laughs> Very scientific. There's, there's, there's a lot. There's uh, some of the strips are straight adaptations of, of you know, the novels. Like there's a, a Roy Thomas is doing a John Carter adaptation uh, that's just, you know, they're just going through the novels, um, and they're doing the same thing with Tarzan. There are also new Tarzan adventures. Uh, that's a different strip. Uh, there's. Uh, Rick Leonardi and I are doing Korak. Those are completely new stories. We're just making stuff up. The the Mucker stories that Lee and I are doing are adaptations of the novels. So there's a mix of of new stuff as well as adaptations. But there's uh, huh, I'm getting a call. Uh, um, but a lot of the a lot of the strips are up upwards of you know 60, 70, 80 strips uh, already. Uh, some of them more. Uh, I think uh, Mucker and Korak both have about 30 strips so far. So there's, you know, there's plenty of material. Yeah. Um, if, you, if, if, you, if you make them into spreads, 40 or 50 strips, you said, so right? Yeah. That can fill up a whole graphic novel. That, 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 that one drives my wife nuts. I, I told her that, uh, I, I told her that, my, that my text message uh, would either be uh, the lightsaber or Chewbacca, and she picked the lightsaber really fast. So. <laughs> well, I think we're uh, I think we're 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 done with time. I think at this point, it was what three forty five. Well, that's done done the off the lights. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dark so, so, That's so, what we call a subtle hint over there. <laughs> the rough up so, music. 
Well, I think I'd like to thank you all for, for coming. I hope you, uh, you uh, got something out of this. And if you have any more questions about Dynamite stuff, please come on by. Um, these gentlemen are going to be here at the show. Do you want to say what booths you're at? If you want to do some signatures later on? Or? I don't know what booth he's at. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know for uh, <laughs> Yeah, P101. Okay. And I'm at 520. Yeah. And, and we, um, we're, actually, off the top of my head, I can't remember what my booth number is, but uh, you'll find us. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's at the one that says Dynamite. Over yeah, it says Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming, guys. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.